Hello, hello everyone. Welcome to Sorbonne Talks. I'm Anuhia. I'm from the Stellar Development Foundation and I'm super excited to bring on our amazing Sorbonne developer, Lee, and our Debra lead, Tyler, onto stream. Hi, everyone. Hi, friends. Hey. All right, so uh, this is Lee's first time on stream with me and also this is like my second stream and we're considering making this into a stream a uh, series of some sort. So if y'all want to do that, let me know in the comments um, because I, I would love to if y'all want to see me more on stream and Tyler on stream. <laughs> we, can, we can alternate Tyler. <laughs> but uh, yeah, hey everyone. So we're going to start off by playing a game of Chrome Dino. I don't know, uh, Tyler, have you ever played Chrome Dino? All the times that my internet goes down out here in the country. Exactly. My score is still not very good, but I do like a little Chrome Dino. Exactly. So we're going to start off by competing with Lee, Tyler, and myself and see who gets the high score um, on Chrome Dino. And then we will jump right. <laughs> it's like the ultimate bait and switch. <laughs> I'm sore about psyche. You were going to play Chrome Dino games. Yo, um, actually, sorry. We're just going to start playing Chrome Dino and uh, figure out who's the best Chrome <laughs> Dino champion. It's stellar. <laughs> All right. So Tyler, I'm going to let you start first. Um, and we're going to see how you do. Oh my gosh. We're not going to do these concurrently. All right, here we go. No, we're going to see who does. We're all watching. <laughs> nice. We're, we're all watching. <laughs> we're, 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 okay. we're waiting for the fail. <laughs> in the meantime, I'm going to soak uh, up all five minutes here. I'm going to start getting my practice in. I don't think it's going to take all five minutes, Tyler. You can't I be that good. So. <laughs> I don't know my skills. Oh, <laughs> But hey, Kanye, well, Nest, Kanye Nest, uh, Raph is in here. There you go. Amir's in here. Enrique. Hello, hello. Feeling stressed watching this, right? That's I died. Tyler. There you go. Right when Raph said, feeling stressed watching this, Tyler just <laughs> in, you know? All right, Lee, are you ready for this? I'm ready. So, uh, 355. Tyler, 355. Okay, all right. I'm frustrated that there's two more zeros after that. Like people actually are getting that high. <laughs> oh, I like the fact that Luke has a volume to it. <laughs> the double jump uh, speed. Oh. <laughs> Busted. Darn. Okay. Tyler takes the, I I'm absolutely awful at this, but I'm like not expecting it. I don't have good. Raph, are you going to make us an NFT for whoever uh, gets high score on this? All right, here we go. Wait, why is it? Oh, okay. Here's cactuses. That's not even fair. You, you have to run like a hundred feet before you even hit a cactus. I know. <laughs> all right. All right. We're getting there. That additional like twinkle sound whenever you jump over, or I guess whenever you get like a hundred or something oh. is very stressful. Okay, I did better than Lee and I'm proud of that. <laughs> but Tyler, I guess you're the yes, no. champion here. <laughs> All right, sweet. So we could play another round or we can keep going. I think we should just kick it off. How do, how do you feel about that? Yeah, let's get rolling. All right, so a couple different announcements uh, while we get settled in is basically today's stream will be about um, one, two things actually. So we have an instant dev environment set up for Sorbonne. So if you're someone like me who has basically never touched Rust till Sorbonne started um, and is just now getting started and has come from like a web to like React Python background and you're like, how do I freaking get started on Rust? Well, we have an answer for you, right Lee? The Git pod answer. So we're going to share that today um, with all of you and do a couple of different demos with it. And this is your chance to ask Sorbon Dev Lee. Uh, I keep saying that, Lee. I hope you're okay with me calling you the, the Sorbon Dev <laughs> Lee. Um, but a Q&A with him. Uh, I posted in our um, Discord a link, and I will share that here as well. But it's basically a link for you to um, put in your questions as you get them. You're also more than welcome to share them on the stream. Uh, we'll see this chat on stream as well. Um, so whatever works for you, uh, use it as you like. And if you actually want to come on stream, uh, let me know in the chat on the Discord, which is the hashtag live chat, um, which is the live chat channel. 
and I will uh, DM you the link to join us on stream actually and bring you on, but that will be a bit later on stream. So I'll let Tyler kick it off. Um, go on, go on in. Super. Yeah, so um, as we mentioned last week, I kind of uh, dove into Soroban myself for the first time a couple weeks ago. Um, I, I was very intimidated by it. I was also very busy. Um, and the, the idea of trying to learn uh, Rust was kind of like, no thanks. I think I'll save that for later. Um, but uh, necessity kind of pushed itself, you know, okay, where everybody's learning Soroban now. And this is kind of the thing that I've wanted ever since I found Stellar way, way back and wanted to do something that Stellar didn't have an operation for. Uh, the ability to have a, a smart contract running uh, behind a single Stellar operation. So we'll get into the nitty gritty of exactly what's going on. But uh, I found it to be far, far easier to kind of get up and running than uh, I thought it would be. Most of these Rust smart contracts are actually really um, small, compact. A lot of your programming interfaces uh, will actually be on the front end, which is typical of smart contract development. Um, so it's not that hard. And now that we've introduced the Gitpod thing, so I was like, I was kind of like two weeks ago, and then I found Gitpod, and oh my goodness, uh, like you just you just click a link and you have a full Rust Soroban environment right inside your browser. It's it's the um, VS Code editor, which is the one I use every day anyway, um, which is amazing, which is kind of this call out to, we're going to be doing Stellar Quest. Anybody that's familiar with Stellar Quest, our next Stellar Quest is going to be a Soroban Quest, and it's going to be all done right inside of a Git pod. So we're not a, uh, Kanye, we're not going to have to answer all of these, um, hey, I'm using Windows and can't figure out how to install Rust. We're just going to focus on the Soroban pieces, not on the environment Rust, future net configurations. It's uh, kind of compiling all this into the, the quick wins of just figuring out, getting our feet wet, um, building out smart contracts. So uh, I am going to bring my screen up. And by me, I mean Anuhia. Um, bring my screen up to um, introduce something that I think, Lee, you added maybe last night. Um, inside of our docs, if you go to any of these examples, they now have an open in GitPod link which will open up all of these different examples right inside the, the VM, the Gitpod VM, where you can run these examples right inside of our uh, example, uh, Soroban examples uh, repo. It opens up that repo inside of a Gitpod, which is amazing. Uh, we're not going to do that right off the bat, though. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open it up with, uh, we've got a Soroban Pioneer Quest. We're actually still building this out, but I thought I'd go ahead and share this. This is kind of, the idea is um, this is going to be a pretty big deviation from what we've normally done with Stellar Quest, where you're playing it with laboratory, you're doing it in quest.stellar.org. Um, now you're going to be doing the quest right inside of a Gitpod, which will be a little bit uh, disorienting, right? Especially for people like Nisho who get um, very angsty and start clicking buttons when they don't quite know what they do yet. So this is going to be allow you to kind of familiarize yourself with the environment. Uh, and that's what we're going to walk through today is this kind of uh, Git pod environment. I'm going to walk you through. Uh, this is not going to, I'm not going to try very hard not to leak any of our quests in this repo. So the actual repo is a secret repo. Good luck finding it. Um, but this particular one, you can go ahead and find and open up. I'll be adding, uh, uh, Elliot's writing some really good um, readme material. I think he's even going to do a video. You'll get to see Elliot on screen. That'll be fun. Uh, walking through the Git pod, so you'll have no excuses to not know exactly how to uh, compete in the in the Stellar Quest whenever we get these these live, hopefully in November. Okay, so I, if you click this open in Git pod, that's going to uh, launch your new Git pod instance. I've, it takes a couple minutes to uh, spin one of these up, not minutes, it takes a few seconds to spin one of these up, but depending on whether there's another pre build running or um, what have you. So I've, I've already got one stood up here. Uh, in my my browser here. This is probably quite tiny, so let me increase the size of that slightly. Um, so what you're seeing here, basically you've got a, a couple of different areas of navigation. If you're familiar with code editors, IDs at all, particularly VS Code, this is going to at least not feel completely uh, foreign to you. But let me, let me just go ahead and walk through a couple of these items, and then we'll begin interacting with them. Uh, make sure to be keeping in your mind questions. Write those down in notes or something, or that uh, type form that 
Anuhia sent out. So we can answer those later on, particularly ones that I won't be able to answer because I am still a newbie like everybody except for Lee. Um, all right. So probably one of the most uh, critical pieces other than the, the actual code we'll be looking through is your um, bash terminal tab over here. So I've actually got a future net that spins up with this Git pod. And so if you were to go to like the ports over here, this little ports tab, you can open up. This is actually delivering right from inside this Git pod. You've got your future net. We can see the latest uh, ingested ledger, uh, 1003. One, so uh, we're syncing successfully with the future net. That's amazing. That all gets configured for you. Um, if you ever want to explore like, okay, that's fancy, but it's a lot of magic. Inside of this Git pod is the commands that actually spin up these different um, terminals. So you can see exactly what commands are being run. So this is how we actually run up that um, that uh, Docker quick start uh, Soroban dev um, Docker image. So that's pretty, that's pretty cool. The other two things that we've got going on are this future net bash and a sandbox bash. So these uh, other two terminal windows. Uh, this first one is one we'll be, we'll, we'll interact with both, but this one, the sandbox is kind of this safe uh, local playground, doesn't interact at all with that future net that we have. And then this, this uh, future net one, this one's connected with uh, environment variables uh, attached right into the, um, into the bash window with uh, all the environment variables we'll need to actually uh, interact with this future net that we have running. So you can see these environment variables running on this future net CLI. So those get passed into the environment on that bash. So um, it's to try and help you. If you accidentally like want to run a future net inside sandbox, you'll just have to pass these environment variables yourself. And if you want to run sandbox in the future net, you'd have to toss those environment variables. So if you end up running into errors or issues, pass in them manually, or um, you can uh, just look over here and try and toggle back and forth. Every now and then you will definitely get boogered and maybe just restart your Git pod uh, or figure out the magic from inside of this uh, Git pod YAML file for the commands that were actually run to spin those up. Tyler, uh, when you, can you zoom in a little bit um, into the screen? Not oh, everyone yeah. is as old as you are new here. Ah, darn. <laughs> uh, yes, good, good, good point. Um, there we go. Better. Now even Kanye can see it. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So those are our terminal windows. We've only got three running up in here. Um, let's go through. Uh, we've we've talked a little about the environments, the the future net here. So this is the this is a quick start image that basically spins up your own like watcher node, um, but it's connected directly to the same future net that's running that you can like access in a laboratory right now, for example. So things that we do inside the future net here will will show up uh, in like if we were to explore uh, operations for a particular account. So that's all uh, quite nice. The main obvious thing that we're all here to do, though, is to actually um, build and test and run um, contracts. So this is where we start to touch uh, actual Rust code. I've only got one quest up in here right now, uh, really to kind of emphasize just the environment and learning that bit first. I just pulled the Hello World example um, from the example, the Sorbonne examples uh, repository. So that's the one that's uh, building up uh, up here. So if we run, you could run cargo, uh, I guess, uh, make build. But um, for people that are maybe unfamiliar with the make file, it's basically, if you're coming from the JavaScript world, it's just like the scripts inside the package. So it's basically just going to run this command. Uh, I'm going to allow pastes because I'm not my own hacker. Um, sweet. So that was nice and quick, less than um, a half of a second. And that'll put that built WASM file. So uh, you write Rust and then it compiles down to a WASM executable. That's the thing that you'll actually deploy or run uh, on the contract. So a lot of times when you've got the Soroban CLI and you're calling something, you'll be referencing this particular WASM file, which speaking of Soroban, you can, we've got uh, those installed, the, the uh, Soroban command. If you're like, okay, well, that's also magic. How'd you install that guy? Um, 
Lee has built us a nice little Docker image um, that pulls in the default uh, Gitpod Docker image, loads up all the stuff we need for that, and then it installs things like Sorabon and Cargo Hack and some other things that we might need. Uh, I'm actually working on a Stellar Quest CLI um, so the you can run all of your Stellar Quest right from uh, the command line. I'll also install that as an executable inside of this Docker file as well. So between the Git pod and the Git pod Docker file, most of the magic is contained within there, um, which is uh, helpful to know for the pro users out there. So anyway, we've got our Sorabon command line, got loads of um, nice sub commands to run here, like invoke, inspect, uh, all those wonderful things. Let's go ahead and really quick. So we went ahead and uh, de we um, bundled, built the, the contract. So it exists. You can see right here, 13 lines of Rust code to say things like hello something, which, okay, fair enough. That's not that crazy. Um, but usually there isn't that much Rust code uh, to actually pull off some pretty complex uh, logic. Like if you look at some of the, I think we've even got an AMM example in there. We've got lots of examples and I don't think any of them ever really start to cross beyond like 200, 300 lines of code. Most Rust contracts are just very compact and small. And once you understand two things, first, Rust is actually um, r really like uh, when you run things, they'll break, but they often will tell you exactly what you did wrong. Um, but also a lot of the Rust stuff um, is contained within the standard library. And so a lot of the things that you might need to learn or do would be inside the standard library. But uh, we've got this flag here that says no standard library. Many times that will bite you if you're if you're very experienced in React. Uh, you're like, where's all my strings and map hash maps and stuff? Um, but where there is no standard library, there's the Sorabon SDK. Um, it's nice because if you're coming from JavaScript and you're just trying to learn this thing, there's actually less Rust stuff you can do. Uh, which keeps that scope of things to learn quite minimal and keeps all of the documentation right inside of that sorabon.stellar.org forward slash docs. All the things you need to know are kind of within that um, domain, which is super nice. Um, all right, sweet. So I'm going to see if I can remember how to actually um, run this contract. So we've got it built, so we should be able to actually call it. I'm going to make sure I'm in my sandbox CLI. And if I remember my homework... We should be able to do Sorabon, invoke, and whenever you get lost, you can add that uh, H flag and it will tell you the different options that you have available. So we are gonna need a an ID and this uh, WASM location. And then if it's got, then we need to call the specific function and then any arguments that it might contain. If we were running it on the RPC, we would either need to pass these flags or they will be pre-filled. You'll notice if I run this exact same command, Sorabon invoke help. Um, these Sorabon or these RPC secrets are already filled in for us. So that we'll use those by default if we're using this particular um, bash tab, which is nice. Okay. So we got that. Let's go into, we need an ID, which we'll just pass it to one. Doesn't really matter because we're going to be calling it locally right off of the target. Uh, I'm at root in my directory, so I should just be able to go target. Oh, this is going to be our actual WASM file that we're targeting. Target, WASM, releases, and I think the name of this was Sorabon contract. WASM, the argument. I guess before we call our argument, we need a function. What function are we going to call? The functions we have available to us are a big fat stack of one of them, uh, and it's hello. And as per tradition, we will call the argument with world. And when we run that, we get the response, just like it told us it would print out the symbol hello. And then the two that we passed it, which is also this symbol, which is the argument that we included. So. We start with this default environment argument, and the second one is that argument that we pass, and you could include other arguments if you wanted, but we just have this one, world, and then it's gonna print back this vector, hello world. Fantastic, that's amazing, you might say, but that's not actually a network. 
Fair enough. Let's see if we can copy the same thing over to our future net. Brilliant. Okay. So we, before we can invoke though, the uh, function contract actually needs to exist uh, on chain. So let's go ahead and deploy. I think that's a command. Uh, it is indeed. Um, we need to deploy it with the WASM file. And I think that's basically all we have to do because our secret key RPC nodes network passphrases are already filled in for us. So deploy the WASM from the target. WASM32 release. Sarban WASM. That's going to deploy that straight onto our future net. Uh, amazing. So this is our... Uh, contract hash. So if we wanted to go and invoke, I'm going to do the crazy thing of just copying this, moving it over to our future net. And the only thing we need to change here, assume that Lee built a good future net. To be honest, Lee didn't build the, the future net. There's lots of people involved. You also want to remove the uh, the wasm. I need to Just remove the wasm. This is what this is. Yep. Passing an actual ID, so we don't need that. We should send that straight over to the future net, and we get hello world back. Now, I know, like many of you, you're thinking, well, that's fancy. Show it to me in laboratory. Well, I can't actually run this in laboratory yet, but what I can do uh, is show you the operation that we just committed. And I'm going to do that by committing the cardinal sin of looking up that secret key that I use. So let's actually, let's do um, something a little bit different. Let's generate a brand new key pair on FutureNet, which all of them are the same. So let's just paste that. I'm gonna write this down in a notes that I have over here so I don't forget it. All right, sweet. So now we're gonna go and we're going to deploy this again. This time we're gonna use a new secret key that one that we just included, so that I don't have to commit the cardinal sin deriving a public key from the secret key on stream, which I did just generate a key on stream, but that's fine. It's a test net, whatever. Okay, so we committed that, submitted that. So if we, right now, if we went and looked up our explore endpoints operations for account, and we just order this by descending. We're going to notice that brand new operation invoke host function. That's really the only operation that classic Stellar has kind of added. And it's um, very cryptic and hard to understand, which is why we have Lee here. Um, let's go ahead and call another one. So we did the deploy. Uh, now we can do the invoke. A new contract ID. So let's put that in. We also need to pass our new, I'll put that right here, new secret key. There's nothing fancy with the secret key. It's a, just a stellar thing. You're just signing the transaction that you're going to submit to the future net. Uh, but rather than having to like submit an XDR or something, you can just pass in the secret key as an argument and it will do all of the signing and submitting um, for you. So there we go, we got our hello world back. And if we run this again, we should see two host invoke host functions. So that was the one that actually built the, or uh, submitted the contract. Um, create contract with source account is the function. And this one is host function, host function, invoke contract. Uh, but again, uh, wicked um, obfuscated behind the uh, allure of what in the world does this XDR actually have behind it. So that's kind of where my demo ends. This is like, to me, this is again, kind of mind blowing where you can build these things relatively quickly and easily, whether it's on FutureNet and actually able to explore it inside of Horizon or in your sandbox, right? We could just go in here and do a public function that reads something, or uh, maybe it saves some data, all those other examples that we were showing. But like, it's actually pretty simple to write a contract and then deploy it, run it, and see it in laboratory, just like you would do with anything else you might do with Stellar. The only difference is what we had before was, here's an operation that is make a payment. Okay, but I want to do something fancy. Too bad. You can make a payment with this operation. Now we have an operation that is invoke smart contract, which does whatever the heck you want to inside of whatever the functions are behind the contract that was uploaded. So it's like this... Um, 
do whatever you want operation uh, in Stellar. And I'm, uh, my goodness, I've wanted that for a long time. And to actually see it working and it's kind of simple and you've got this nice Gitpod environment to do all this stuff. I don't know about you, but I think I'm going to quit working for SDF and start writing smart contracts because this this I haven't been this excited about actually building on Stellar since I found Stellar way back in 2014. This is amazing. And and again, like you're discovering Stellar for the first time in 2014, you're like, okay, sweet. I think at the time there was like 12 things you could do with Stellar. And then there, now there's like 22 or something. Now there's an infinite well, number uh, of things you can do with Stellar. And that is incredible. Like I was super excited before just finding Stellar. Now, I mean, this is, this is, this is something else. And um, I don't know. I'm, I can't wait to start writing like NFT, weird NFT, smart contracts, all that stuff that I was trying to do with Stellar turrets that was very difficult and lots of hoops to jump through. Um, now, now this is this, I can't wait to just start writing weird yeah. contracts. My mind is, uh, it's been hard to shut down um, for all the crazy things I want to do. Um, I might have to create a pseudonym for Sora Bonathon so I can uh, try and swoop in on some of those prizes. Uh, Okay, enough of me talking. I do still have some questions. You should show, um, before you you take it away, you should show how easy it is to write tests. Yeah. I have no idea how to write a test. I've never written a REST test in my life. So maybe... uh, Is there... What's in the test file? Is that the... this, This one right here. Yeah, so this is a real, real simple test that's just calling that hello function exactly the same way that you invoked it on the command line. And there's a little tiny text at the top of the function, run test. If you click that, click the run test, it's going to run it here in your browser. So you can individually run, like when you're running the entire test, like is this now individually taking that component and running a test on it, please? Okay. Yeah, exactly. Is that what this mod test thing is? Yeah, like, was... how, how does it link between the lib and the test file? Uh, the mod test is just telling the project that, oh no, what's going on here? Um, it's just telling the compiler that that other test Rust file should be included because the, the, all the Rust files are not included by default. Uh-huh. They all have to be referenced from that, that lib. Um, and it looks like we got some sort of bug in our GitHub setup. If you if you run a cargo clean, Tyler. And then just cl- try clicking that run test again. Oh. Debug it live. This is like the most satisfying thing of GitPod, I feel. I mean, it's satisfying anytime to watch anything compile, but this is really satisfying. This thing always gives me anxiety because it's like, really? yes, I've waited for 30 seconds to get to 142 and then it'll be an error. And like, oh, shoot, now I got to fix that and then wait another five Fair seconds. Enough. Yeah, there's a lot of dependencies because this what this test is doing is there's, there's only, what, like five, six lines of code here. Um, but that env default that's at the beginning of the test is actually the Sorbonne environment. And it's not... Uh, a mock environment, it's the actual Sorbon environment that gets embedded in the Stellar oh, wow. core nodes, um, and we're using it here in the test. So when you're writing t- Rust tests here uh, in your contract, you are actually testing your contract um, in much the same way that it would be running on chain. Uh, so you have all the same things available to you. Uh, you can even do things like integration tests across other contracts. So you can import um, <laughs> another contract that you're calling uh, or maybe several contracts you're calling, and you can write tests using your contract and all of those contracts together and you know, see for real how it's actually going to behave. Wow. <laughs> that's so cool. That's, is that, that's one of the advantages of having like the entire thing be being written in Rust, where you get this Rust environment that can be like pulled out of actually running it in core, but it's the actual environment that is running in core. Exactly. Yay, our test passed. <laughs> Also, All of that yeah, for I, one test, okay. It needs um, to be like capital okay. I found this, yeah. It's like okay with an exclamation. Um, but that could also mean it's not okay. But ha ha, no, anyone. <laughs> um, anyways, uh, Lee, there's a fun question which says, is this a smart contract to find out what Lee's Halloween costume will be this year? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna dress up as Hello Dev. It's not a bad idea. <laughs> Yeah, we're going to have to have a little bit smarter contract. 
Very, yeah, very okay. smart, smart contract. Very before smart. We're able to guess what Lee's Halloween costume is. Right. <laughs> but Tyler, so you wanted to ask Lee some questions, I believe. Correct? Yeah. So um, one of like my main question is I'm even as I'm writing Stellar Quest quests, one of the things I'm going to have to do is okay. Um, people are doing their quests. They they do their Hello World. Like one of the first quests. The spoiler alert might be to call um, Hello World. Um. I know I can find that they did that, but I don't know how to prove that in this, that they actually submitted Hello World. And I'm guessing it's something to do with one of these parameters, um, maybe something with the footprint. Can you just like walk us through, A, am I gonna be able to do like build a Stellar Quest off of the data that I'm getting inside of the operations to check if what someone submitted was what I expected? because uh, this XDR is not immediately helpful to me. Mm -hmm. And then secondarily to that, the heck is a footprint? Yeah, these are good questions. Can you can you zoom in a little bit? Yeah, okay, um, sorry. It's pretty, pretty small uh, for me. Um, the, yeah, we've got three fields here and uh, you're right, they don't really tell us a whole lot on the surface. There's two tools we can use to understand like what this mumble jumble um, words are we can either use the laboratory uh, whenever you've got it in future net mode um, so if you want to open that up in another tab we can try putting that into into the laboratory you can also use the sorb and cli it also has a sub command where you can just paste this and it would print out this is what the value is um, but maybe we can use the laboratory a lot of people probably so yeah this is this is laboratory right here mm -hmm. do you want me to copy one of these xdr values over yep. to the view xdr yes Okay, so I just copied this one with type object. 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 <laughs> yeah, so what you want to do is grab the yeah, XDR type. It should be SC val. If you look for SC val, it'll be down there deep in the. And okay, it's not actually rendering something that's super useful here. <laughs> that's well, I mean, I mean, I mean that's that's. If you, uh, uh, is this base sixty four? Yeah, base sixty four decode that. It wasn't small or you enough. You can get a base sixty four dot x y z. Is a. Does this convert to? Okay, wait. Facing in strange URLs. Okay. Oh, either. Oh no! What is the, what is this value? We should have started with the second two. I don't remember. Okay, what the, we can start with the second two. Do, do, do the second one first. I'm going to try to see if I can remember what, what the first one is and why we can't decode it. Oh, the first one's the contract ID. Oh, so it's a hex. Or, or the contract function or something like that. So let me let me uh, run my super powerful other VM called RunKit and do buffer from... Um, A64 and then two string. This is probably a hex, yeah. That's our contract ID, maybe. Ish. Um, which that was, that was not, uh, that was the actual XDR value. This was the A64 D. So that's our contract hash right there. All right, so that's uh, one problem solved. Now we need um, this one, sim. Yes, let's have a look at what that is. View XDR. Those, is this also an SC value? This is also an SC val. So if you copy that sim value and stick it into the base64 decoder, it should that should come out as a string. All right. Without the the hex, yep. Hello, sick. All right, what's uh? Wait, that was our that was our that's first your... argument, right? By default, that's our function that name. Oh, that was the output. That that's, was the output. No, 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 no. That's the input. That's the function name. So ah, the first parameter the was the contract ID. The second parameter was the function we're calling, and then all the parameters after that our should be the arguments. Fingers crossed, everybody. Wait, I gotta gotta turn it out of the XDR into a sixty four. 
A64, will it say world question mark? Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I can write my checks. Ha ha, everyone. You'll have to actually do what the challenge says or you're busted. Amazing. And is it almost always, so when I look at VueXDR, this thing just got absolutely enormous. Are there many other things that people will need to be aware of or is SC Val kind of cover most of our ground here? SCVAL covers any any value that, that's being used as like an input or an output or like of a contract function, uh, or, as well as anything that's being stored. So if you're storing something on chain, some data to look up again later, mm -hmm. maybe like balances, things like that, they're all ultimately going to be stored inside an SCVAL. And SCVAL is really a, a union of lots of other types. So here we can see this SCVAL is a symbol. Uh, there are integers. Um, there's like byte arrays, oh, nice. maps, vectors, um, begins. They all fall under that SCVAL. I spent too long trying to figure out how to decode this, and I just, <laughs> just had to get on stream. That's all I had to do. That makes a ton of sense. All right, fantastic. Well, now I know how to bust everybody for passing the arguments and making sure they actually submit the right thing. Next, the heck is a footprint? Yeah. This is also an XDR. Is this? Yeah. I really hope it has something to do with Bigfoot, but I'm guessing it doesn't. You can try decoding that if you want. I, I don't remember what the type is exactly. It's probably the ledger footprint is the type. Um, there's a the yeah. contract ID. And this, this is not necessarily particularly interesting uh, for this specific contract because this contract doesn't access any data or anything like that. So what, what a footprint is, is um, it's us telling uh, the runtime uh, what data the contract may write to or read from. Uh, and the reason this exists is because uh, we don't, uh, we want the runtime to know what data might the contract will need to, to be accessing because that helps us do things like run contracts uh, concurrently at the same time. So um, we, we're building Sorobin with the advantage that we've we've seen other blockchains already build, um, you know, smart contract runtimes, and we know that scaling uh, blockchains is um, is difficult, and so we're planning that from the get go with mm -hmm. Sorobin. And one, the footprint the footprint is like part of that. the The idea is that when you invoke a contract, you define what data might need to be accessed um, by the contract. And then the runtime knows how to paralyze contracts that don't need to access or write to the same data. So in this contract uh, invocation, uh, if we looked at the code, you'd say it's not accessing any data. So why is there, there's one entry here, there's one read only entry, the contract data. Um, and the key is not particularly descriptive, it's a static. Um, I see, and what that is, is the contract code itself. So we're saying that with this contract invocation, the only contract data it needs to read or write is the actual contract code that gets loaded into the runtime. But if you were writing, if you, if you had a contract where you were updating a balance, uh, you would need to in include the ledger key in this footprint for the balance that was planned to be updated. I think that's making sense. I know there, so yeah. There is a question here. So what is the footprint of a function that uses an environment invoke contract? All right. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, it should be, it, it'll be the footprint of whatever that other contract requires. So at the very least, it's going to require the contract code. Um, so there'll be like another entry like what we see here on screen, except the contract ID won't be uh, the calling contract, it'll be the contract that's going to be called. Uh, and then if that contract needs to go and accessing data, uh, you would also need to be pre-included. You need to be predetermining what data is going to be accessed and including that in the footprint. Is there a limit to like the depth that that can go before it becomes difficult? The di I mean, there, there will be limits for um, the runtime, especially like once it gets to PubNet. I think we're still figuring out a lot of what those you know those levers should be set up mm -hmm. uh, so for FutureNet, i mean FutureNet doesn't have fees enabled either so um you know these are things which we're building out and they'll they'll be in future 
future future net iterations. Um, yeah, I think uh, a question that maybe arises uh, from this is, you know, I, I said that the footprint is something that you have to predetermine. You as the person building the transaction, you have to go and figure out what the footprint should be. And that maybe can be a bit of a daunting task. Um, and so um, we have this thing called pre-flight or simulation uh, mm -hmm. where you can submit a transaction without the footprint. So no footprint required. Um, and it's not executed on chain, it's just it's simulated. And then you get back, it basically gives you back the footprint. So you can then just go and submit the transaction with that footprint. So you yeah. don't really have to determine it yourself. I know when I was looking at the network requests inside of um, uh, Paul's uh, example DAP, there was loads of those pre-flights whenever something was happening to go and find what the actual submission call should look like. And it's also the way that you do um, read requests. So if you're if you don't actually need to submit something to the network, you just need to get data out of the network. You can use those pre pre-flight requests to um, grab information from the ledger from the horizon endpoint without actually having to submit the transaction, which I thought was kind of kind of cool. There are a few other questions here. It says like, why have one type of uh, SE value for everything, architecture wise? Question mark. Um, that's a good question. I think uh, the values get used in a lot of places where, um, you know, like as function inputs, function outputs, and we really need one type uh, that's going to contain all those other types. Um, yeah, I, I, that's sort of I, that, that flavor of design really comes from like the way that XDR, like the, the Stellar Network uses XDR for structuring um all of the data they get stored and uh that's just a really common way of solving that problem in the xtr um trying to see there are a few other questions here uh that i guess we can shift a little bit but uh it says how should one think when writing sorbon contracts that involves not mucking up Keep it small and apparently write good tests because I made it a long way and then I had to write a test and it broke. So write good tests, um, start out really small. I don't know, have fun, right? Right now it's like on FutureNet. So play around, learn what you're doing. Um, but yeah, Nisha, you'll figure it out. <laughs> I believe in you. Do the Stellar Quest. That'll that'll, that'll go a long way. Sorbonne Quest, you mean? Tyler? Quest. Stellar Quest, Sorbonne Quest, Quest version series. Um, I do have another question, and this is particularly coming from a um, JavaScript engineer perspective. Is is there a way to like watch contracts so that as you make changes, it kind of runs tests and compiles in like as you save files or is that something you have to like always be building, always be testing? Is the idea that you just kind of click run test every time you up update some code sort of thing? You you fix your tests, you write your code, you run test again. What's the what's the development flow tend to be when making changes? Yeah, I mean there's a couple of options here. It really comes down to you know what you like to do. Uh, if you're a VS code um, user, there should be um, my shortcut codes are customized, so I, I won't say what it is because I don't know what the default is, but there's a shortcut code you can press um, to run the last test or run the test under your current cursor. Um, and so a common development flow is you, you just keep hitting that key after you've made some changes and it'll go run the test you care about in that moment. Um, there's another great tool called Cargo Watch, uh, which you can, uh, it may actually be installed in this Git bug. I think I think I saw it was installed in the Docker file, um, and if you use Cargo Watch, by default it probably just builds, and that may not be what we want. But if you, um, I think it's like Cargo Watch space dash x space test, and that'll just run the tests every time you change the files. Cool. Yeah. So this, I think, by default it just it builds, right just builds you, and then tests. Yeah, that makes sense. And I uh, will definitely help. It's just a very foreign environment 
but it's not a poor one. It's just a very foreign environment for a JavaScript developer. So knowing what that narrative is like for actively working on a contract um, is an important one. Um, that was just a link that I wanted to share. Well, I guess Kanye and us wanted to share. Yeah, if there are Rust developers in the chat that have the ways that they run these, A, submit it to the Sorabonathon yeah, because please. I need to know how to build these faster. And uh, and B, put those in, in chat with links and such. Yeah. It's so one of the things I love about the Rust community is it's very aware of how hard it is to learn Rust. And so people are very eager Rolling. to to share all the things that they do and the tips and tricks they have for getting up to speed and actually building contracts and stuff. Um. Yes, yeah, so uh, you, can, you can, yeah, you can write unit tests, uh, but you can also write integration tests in the sense that if your contract is using other other contracts, um, you can uh, download those contracts. Uh, at the moment, you just have you have to manually download them as a .dot wasm file. Um, in the future, you know, hopefully, we'll have some like better mechanics around that where they can just be automatically downloaded. Um, but uh, yeah, you, you import that wasm file. You can register that contract in your test. So it's there registered in the environment, just as if it had been deployed on chain. Uh, and then your your contract, when you're running its tests, can be calling through to it. So you don't have to be, um, you don't have to set up mocks. You don't have to set up, you know, these fake tests if your, uh, if your contract is interacting with all these other, um, other things. And uh, we don't have this implemented today, but, um, the environment can have data preloaded into it, that, that environment that we saw in the tests. And so uh, we do want to build toolings to, to, to do things like take uh, data that's on chain. Like if you know, you, you basically take like a specific ledger and then you could write tests that actually use contracts that are actually, that have been actually deployed as well as data that's been actually, that actually existed on, on the ledger at that point in time. <laughs> There's another question that came in through the um, forum here, Lee, which says, when you execute a contract, who provides the computing power to process the function? Normally, when I write a function and run it, it's my PC or server I arranged that's burning some uh, CPU cycles. How does that work with Uh Is the question like during testing, or do you mean like when the contract is actually running? I feel like they are probably referring to when the contract is running. I guess, okay, or yeah. when you I mean, execute, yeah. When Tyler like deployed the contract on chain, he uploaded he uploaded all of that the code onto not, not the, the compiled version of the contract onto the chain, mm -hmm. and then when he invoked it, he was giving the contract he was giving the, he was telling the chain like go and run this code. So the code is running on all of the nodes uh, of the network, mm -hmm. and the nodes are all agreeing on like this is the outcome of running that that contract. Got it. Got it. Um, Decentralization. <laughs> there are a, one more question that came in here, which says um, how Sorbonne adopted zero knowledge proofing. Sorbonne supports. <laughs> yeah, I think we're like very interested, I think, in, in supporting like different uh, crypto primitives and um, the, if you go and have a look in the the, the Discord, you know, we've, there have been some conversations around like what crypto primitives should we be supporting, you know, how, for supporting things like that. Um, right now, the only crypto primitives implemented as available uh, in the Sorobin SDK uh, are just the really basic ones that you uh, would typically see in the Stellar ecosystem today. Things like SHA-256 um, and ED-25519 keys. Um, but we're definitely very interested in finding out like, you know, what people want or see that they need. And we have ideas about uh, what can be added and, and, you know, we'll definitely be looking into that. Yeah. Sweet. I think that is about all the questions that there are. Anyone else have any final questions here? I'd be curious, Lee, as you kind of have a, a really broad knowledge of Sarban and where it's going and you're working with internal and external teams on roadmaps and, are there things that you'd really like to see people work on or provide feedback for, or what's yeah. kind of the most exciting thing that comes across your desk as far as community engagement or things that people are doing or 
maybe mm -hmm. areas of opportunity that you feel like people maybe aren't quite recognizing yet that you'd like to ensure that people are aware of? And like, what would you like to see come through Sora Bonathon? Yeah, I think um, definitely the big ticket thing is writing contracts, like getting more people writing contracts, providing feedback ar around uh, what they've found uh, convenient or inconvenient around what they have found um, to be, uh, you know, conceptually made sense. You know, if they wanted to do X and the SDK helped them to do X or, or didn't help them to do that or got in their way. We def like the, that's, I think probably the biggest thing is, is dog fooding, um, writing contracts and discovering what's missing, what the gaps are, all that sort of stuff. That That's what uh, really interests me. And I've seen like a lot of, um, good posts on the Sora, Sora, I can't even say this, Sora Bathonum. Sora Bonathon? Sora Bonathon, that's it. Um, uh, that, that have been very interesting and, and, you know, people exploring how does authentication work um, and ex uh, providing examples of where it works really well, where it's, you know, got some rough edges and, and that, that's, that's fantastic because that gives us all as a community the opportunity to figure out what needs to change between now, where we're at, we're at right now, FutureNet version one, what needs to change between now and getting to testnet and pubnet down the road? Yeah, absolutely. We actually had that exact uh, example come through uh, this week, I believe. Uh, there you go. Wow. I, <laughs> Raf is already on it, uh, like sharing the links to it. But yeah, no, definitely. Like I think we want to, the whole reason for Sorbonathon to exist is like simply to help with the development and like dog fooding Sorbon to like the ecosystem and then to let our dev team um, know how can they actually take it and improve Sorbonne, right? Like we're listening, basically. Um, I see another question here, which says, oh, uh, yeah. Um, I think Connie Ness, you have the right answer there, uh, where it is, would SCF allow the next round of Sorbonne related projects? Um, that's probably like a, it, it, I would say yes, probably, but don't quote me on that. Uh, but yeah, I, I'd say we'll, we'll support once once it hits mainnet because the point of a, a SCF is um, to run live businesses uh, kind of in production. And if you're, please don't run a production level business on a test net or a future net. Yeah. So be working on your business ideas now. You can't just spin up a business in a month. Some of you probably could. Um, so that there's like, get started, get ready so that whenever there is an SCF round that is uh, accepting um, that are that are built on top of Sorabonathon. Sorabon, wow, it's not called Sorabon anymore. Now it's just Sorabonathon. Um, <laughs> how the tables turn. Uh, then then we'll be ready to accept those those inbounds. But it's definitely coming. Um, we just don't want to encourage people building businesses on top of test nets. That said, I would love to potentially, we were just at, like, since this is like, uh, we're, I, I consider this like a very casual conversation with our community, but we're considering maybe doing like a hackathon in the future. By future, I mean like next month um, or the month after, uh, where basically it would be for you to come up with those ideas. You can submit proposals, Sorbon related ideas, and like do example contracts and so on and so forth. So we'd really like to see you like, we don't want to stop you from ideating at the moment. So if you had ideas, please start working on them because there will come a time when we want those ideas uh, brought to us uh, from the community. We want to support you the best way we can. So, yeah. Yeah. And I'd say, well, probably like Sorabonathon is Sorabonathon first light. We're going to run more, right? The next one will be Sorabonathon super yeah. tools uh, or yeah. something where, where <laughs> we're coming up with like a new theme, New, new funding round, looking for a different type of content. And one of those might be some of the tooling that, that we really want to, to see on the network. Some of that like open Zeppelin type contracts as the, as the platform continues to mature and change less, um, it'll become safer, I guess, to begin writing more of these mature uh, production ready contracts, but we got to be careful in the sequencing of things that we don't um, write contracts that are just going to be constantly breaking or make it kind of disincentivize uh, an environment from breaking things um, in order to improve the final product. So you want to keep things a little play doh in uh, in the first in the first early stages, so that so that it's fine to constantly be breaking things because nobody's built anything too mature yet. Yeah, absolutely. So don't so muck up on the future net so you don't have to on the pub net is the takeaway here, I guess. Um, 
but yeah i think that is everything for this week y'all once again Thor Bonathon is still a thing. It's happening. It's going to keep happening and keep playing when tinkering with Sorbonne. Like you literally can earn Exelon for doing that. I don't know why you aren't. Like I said, I'm always ready to quit my job and start working on Sorbonne, but um, I do like my job. I like talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Anyways, y'all, thank you all for joining. Uh, we will be back next week um, on Friday with Senso actually talking about his assembly script SDK. So stay tuned for more details on that. Uh, we're really excited. And that's always a good time to just ask questions uh, in general about Sorbon. We're all about Sorbon. Thanks. That's a wrap on Sorbon Talks, y'all. Thank you. Thanks Bye. a bunch. See ya. Anuhia Lee.